welcome everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, the symposium for some. And uh, um, see your names, I think. Yeah, we've all met. And so I don't have to introduce myself. We have I come to the final session of this year's symposium. And we titled it uh, Looking Back on Four Years of MCICM. Because we thought it would be um, maybe interesting, but at least also important for us to, to share some of the work we have been doing in the past four years and maybe also look ahead uh, what, what lies uh, before us. So um, <clears throat> the idea is that, that I will start with uh, a brief presentation on the MCICM and the ideas behind it and then uh, Neil Smith, uh, the postdoc, will take over to present his research, uh, followed by uh, Denise Petzold, who is um, uh, the PhD student in the center presenting her research. Then there is hopefully time for, uh, for some questions, if there are any, and we will end with uh, closing remarks from my side. And as mm, yeah, maybe all of you know, uh, we don't have uh, a keynote speech because our keynote speaker uh, got ill. So uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Can you see this? Okay. Yeah, looking back at, at four years of MCICM is, is almost strange because I uh, vividly remember uh, the first meeting I had with uh, Stefan Rozu, who was here uh, yesterday, uh, the uh, director of the Film Museum Nederland, and also the dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences of Maastricht University. And the topic of the discussion was how can uh, <clears throat> the orchestra be helped or collaborate with the university around the theme of innovation. And that conversation was actually the start of, um, of a collaboration that still continues till today. And um, apart from the orchestra and the university, at some point also Zuid University entered this collaboration, which makes total sense since they house the, uh, the conservatory. And the center is uh, generously funded by the three partners, but also by the province of Limburg. Um, which is why you see these four logos. When we started, um, there were basically two narratives defining uh, the direction in which our research uh, developed. Um, the first, you might say, was a, a narrative of concerns, uh, concerns about changes in classical music practice, stagnating audience numbers, um, budget cuts, and the kind of neoliberal market discourse where concert goers are primarily seen as consumers instead of citizens who feel a responsibility for the practice. And also more generally, a topic that we also discussed during this symposium, uh, the, um, the societal relevance and, and even impacts of orchestras being increasingly contested. In response to this, this narrative of concern, you might say there is also a narrative of hope and future. Um, where it's about orchestras connecting to new audiences, moving out of the concert hall, um, the whole digital domain, of course, uh, being uh, ever more important, uh, attempts at redefining social relevance and also uh, new forms of collaborations. And of course, the MCICM itself embodies that kind of collaboration. And collaboration, I think, is also the theme of my short presentation. Because when I look back on four years of MCICM, um, I see specifically, I mean, a lot of work, but also a lot of, of attempts at collaborating between these three partners. I mentioned them already. Um, and they had all, from their own perspective, a stake in working, researching uh, on the theme of innovation of classical music. 
So for instance, the South Netherlands for Philharmonic and South University of Applied Sciences or the Conservatory, uh, they share an interest in the innovation of the professional classical music education and also its practice. Yeah, the Conservatory uh, educates the musicians of tomorrow. Between the South Netherlands and, and Maastricht University, the idea was from the beginning that knowledge, uh, research, uh, academic research also, would help the orchestra to, to innovate, uh, but there were also chances for fundraising. And then finally, between Maastricht University and uh, Zuid University, there was the emerging theme of artistic research, uh, research done in the artistic practice, and also taking this practice as a methodological vehicle. And increasingly, uh, there are ties between academic research and uh, universities and, uh, for instance, institutes for higher music education. This is a picture from the early days of the center where uh, the Philharmonie Zuid Nederland is performing the fourth symphony uh, of Beethoven in a refurbished industrial building in Eindhoven. And it has become an iconic picture. You see it uh, on many of our, um, uh, for instance, on the website, but we use it again for the website for this symposium. And I think with a good reason. Because to me, this, this picture shows the idea of the symphony orchestra and related to that also the uh, conservatory as a laboratory for innovating well, the practice. And we already discussed yesterday that um, innovating the practice also means innovating the music. And this is exactly what you can see here. Very briefly, the audience was invited to listen to Beethoven in three different situations. In the uh, front, you see them sitting at the feet of the conductor, even lying down. Uh, more in the back, you can see audience members yeah, being manipulated almost um, in order to experience Beethoven in a different way, for instance, standing against these beds, and then these beds will be tilted to a horizontal position, and they will feel the music in their spine, and more in the background, you can see audience members listening to live electronic uh, manipulations of the, the music by Beethoven. I find this a really interesting situation <clears throat> because it also raises the question, what does all of this do to Beethoven? What does it do to the act of listening? If we think of Beethoven and the attentive listening that is normally organized in a concert hall, that scene is crucial to experience Beethoven, that's all being changed here. And so in a sense, this picture also embodies the concept of musicking, it was already mentioned before, Christopher Small, music as an activity, and if you want to think about it, you cannot stop at the score, at the, the, the notes, you have to think about it as an activity, as a, a practice and a situation, and this is, um, I would say, a very fascinating situation. Because it shows, in a way, a future, a possible future for classical music. And futuring was also the theme of our symposium last year. And I take some of the problems that we worked on in the past couple of years from the introduction of um, an edited volume that we are preparing um, in the MCICM, a text written by Neil Smith. And he um, formulated three, I would say, um, quintessential problems at the moment in classical music. First of all, the obsolescence problem, the idea that classical music no longer appeals to the young. And this is a kind of future where the art form slowly withers and dies if it cannot find greater relevance to younger people, families and people in employment. And related to that is a demographic problem. And that refers to the supposedly narrow socio-demographic appeal of classical music as a preserve of the modern day bourgeoisie taking place in high end locations, um, which present social as well as financial barriers. 
and as we have discussed also during this symposium, it is also racially homogeneous to a significant degree. What I find fascinating in classical music is that it, that it is an art form that revolves around music from the past to a large extent. And that also raises the question is how we can bring this past into the present in, in meaningful ways. Maybe more so than any art form, this is a problem for classical music because to some um, music halls have become museums and are unable to respond to contemporary currents in society and therefore become increasingly irrelevant to what is happening around it. So this raises the question we also addressed during this symposium is how to connect the practice in meaningful ways to current day issues and, um, and situations. Briefly on the, uh, the research lines that have organized our research. First of all, um, yeah, how can classical music as an art form interact with societal contexts and actors in new ways? How can we rethink and innovate the ways in which audiences participate in classical music contexts, uh, concerts? And finally, how can we find new ways of making classical music as sounding heritage artistically relevant in 21st societies, century societies. Now, yesterday we have already heard about the Art for Participation project, which was a quite large project funded by the Dutch research um, uh, organization. And uh, it focused, as we heard yesterday, on a combination of academic and artistic research um, into ways of innovating the practice in artistically relevant ways. We did experiments and uh, the outcome, the reflection on these experiments took the form of a learning model. And as Thies and Veerle have uh, explained yesterday, the uh, learning model is also and you can you can find it on the website of the project artfulparticipation.nl. Here are the people: Veerle, Thies van der Werf, Imogen Eve, who worked on uh, on this artful participation project. And next to them, uh, we also have myself, a special chair, Innovation of Classical Music, Denise, who will say more about her research in a minute, and also. Neil uh, Smith and Carolee uh, Galinia Molina. And um, yeah, she, she does research support and is immensely important to the organization of everything we, we do. Organizing the research, we try to connect to existing programs and initiatives. Um, some of them in the university of Maastricht, specifically the Faculty of Arts and Social Science, Zuid Hogeschool, uh, and also importantly, the Research Center Art Autonomy in the Public Sphere, um, where we have collaborated with uh, Ruud Binschop. Um, of course, we have worked a lot with Philomenie Zuid Nederland. We have collaborated and still are with some partners in Maastricht and the U region for instance, the Orlando Festival. And we have tried to connect to international partners, to national and international partners in cities that are mentioned here. What we also try to do is to develop and to contribute to platforms for cooperation and exchange. Um, we have uh, organized monthly seminars, of course, projects and experiments. Uh, the yearly symposium is one of our main activities. We have been quite active in trying to build an online um, repository, you might say, in which we were able to map international best practices in the innovation of classical music. And that is something we are still working on. And finally, of course, we have our website and newsletter. <clears throat> 
yeah, lessons learned so far. If I look back, I mean, there is, of course, there is, there is a lot. We have, we have done a lot, but a few things stand out when I, when I look back and reflect on what we learned. First, um, it's very clear that that innovation and innovation of classical music requires interdisciplinary research. So in our academic research, we draw on a whole range of fields, including music, sociology, uh, science and technology studies, but also um, other forms of ethnographic research. Methodologically, uh, this research is also diverse because we, uh, we not only do research in an academic context aimed at publishing articles and books, but as I already said, we also see artistic research, research in the practice as a very important um, element of, of our work. When I talk about research in practice, it's important to know that this is often about learning. Um, and when I say learning, that's of course a very broad term. Thies talked about uh, three forms of learning yesterday, uh, the therapeutic learning, reflexive learning, and uh, experimental learning. And this learning is, is, um, has been very much part of our collaborations with the orchestra, for instance, in organizing uh, the experiments. Learning is something that requires collaboration um, and you would say yeah that makes total sense but what we experience in the past couple of years is that collaboration is not easy uh, in fact it's had its moments of um, uncertainty maybe even frustration and we all realize that collaboration across disciplinary boundaries, but also across institutional boundaries can be risky. Something is at stake. Yeah? Quality repertoires have already been mentioned, ways of working, um, uh, vocabularies. Uh, and these, these are all, uh, we all bring them to the table when we collaborate. So that means that collaboration requires work and not only work, but also the courage and care yeah, to, to bring this collaboration to a fruitful end. What we also realized and, and experienced very often is that this work of collaboration has to balance different logics. Um, for instance, you have a, prod, um, a logic of production in the orchestra. And when we did these experimental concerts, um, we became, as researchers, academic researchers, artistic researchers, part of that logic of production. Uh, in the end, the experimental concert had to happen. Then there is the logic of, of creativity, of being able to create something new um, that is often difficult to reconcile with the logic of production. These two are quite often in tension. And then of course, there is the logic of reflection that maybe comes yeah, easier to academics than it, practitioners. At the same time, the reflective practitioner is an incredibly important element of practice. What we found is that these, that these logics are often in tension and that it takes time. Uh, to balance them, uh, sort of continuously be in dialogue. And finally, uh, and also importantly, when we look forward, um, it is important to keep formulating and reformulating shared goals uh, between the, the partners. And that is exactly the point where we have arrived now in the uh, um, in the history of the MCICM, where we are looking forward and are trying to find ways to continue our work, but I will say more about that at the end of this session. So thank you. This is where I want to pass on to Neil. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, yes, so I was tasked with working on the, the research line of social relevance. I'll just share my screen 
And um, the way that I approached this question was actually to look at uh, space. So um, I found that space is a resource that orchestras were often trying to use in order to reach more people and in order to appear more socially relevant. First of all, you might think of that in terms of concert format, um, for example, the Beethoven restart in the industrial area, in the industrial building. Um, but I then sort of went a little bit further to think about how orchestras sort of inhabit space and particularly the buildings that they look at, that they inhabit. Um, why look at, so this presentation is really about why look at musical buildings and what they can tell us uh, about this relationship between music and society. To get the uh, sort of most obvious reason out of the way, these are very significant uh, interventions. So if you build a new musical building, it's usually the single biggest economic intervention that an organisation will have. Um, often using public money, so these are all sort of very straightforward reasons why this might be important and that why you want these to be effective. Um, although it's always worth remembering that the upkeep of buildings and the continued support of organisations um, over a long period will often match or perhaps exceed the, the investment in buildings, which is something that when you're trying to get a new building built can sometimes be slightly uh, forgotten about. But there are three further, perhaps more um, more subtle reasons why I think it's important to consider these buildings, both from a practice perspective and in terms of research. And the first is that I think these buildings tell us something about uh, the relationship between music and society. And this is something that's been reasonably well established in various literatures about particularly the 19th century concert hall um, and modern concert halls, while differing uh, in some respects, uh, usually quite subtly, that have a lot of the same things in common. Um, and really this is about uh, the division between audience and performer, the relative um, inactivity of the audience. It's a space where participation is not really encouraged, where music um, it very much relates to the sort of quasi-religious ideal about music. Um, and it often tries to get as many people, fits as many people in as possible to experience it. So Kay says that the modern concert hall, which is the sort of the legacy of the 19th century concert hall, is an exemplar of acoustically architected space, physically uh, frames a persistent, idealised and hegemonic practice of listening by the way it organises sound as spectacle. So using this idea from mainly looking at 19th century halls, we can argue that buildings make concrete certain sets of musical values. And um, for the traditional concert hall, those are very much the values of the 19th century bourgeoisie. Um, but we would also argue, and this is something Peter and I argue in a chapter, um, I'll reference the end of this presentation, but um, they also try to realize in certain circumstances, particular musical futures or musical experiences. So if you think about Wagner and Bayreuth, or uh, Boulez and Ircam, so with Wagner, Bayreuth is um, not in an urban location. It's very much a site of pilgrimage where people go um, to experience only his music, pretty much. Um, and in fact, when he originally has the idea for Bayreuth, he says that he um, wants to create a temporary wooden structure and then you know the, the score will be ritually burned afterwards and potentially even, even the structure. So it's, um, it very much plays into this very strong ideas of what sort of musical experience he's looking for there. With Boulez and Irkam, that's a sort of laboratory for sound because it's very much about bringing technology and music into, uh, into dialogue. That's kind of uh, there's an interesting relationship there with where Irkam is positioned within the city and it's kind of underground. It's not nearly as obvious as many uh, concert spaces are, it's, uh, particularly if you compare it with uh, the Philharmonie in Paris, which is the 2015 bottom left example there, which is extremely prominent in a park and is very, very shiny. So that's a sort of saying that there is, although these buildings can tell us something about the modern relationship, uh, about the relationship between uh, music and society, and that as these buildings change, they might be able to tell us something about uh, sort of modern society. And this is relates to reason two. So if we quote uh, Pavlos Philippou, who says, uh, well, I put in cultural buildings, and he looks at two concert halls and other cultural buildings as well. 
that had become not only an integral part of urban reasoning, but also amongst the normally prioritised urban artefacts, a state of affairs that appears to satisfy both those professionally engaged in the formation of cities and the wider public. So essentially he's saying that concert halls and cultural buildings still inhabit incredibly prominent positions within the city. And for all the talk of the crisis of classical music, um, we're still building these halls and they're still incredibly prominent. They're still seen as linchpin buildings for new um, for the re regeneration of particular particular areas. So if we look at um, the, the Elbphilharmonie there in the bottom right, that was part of a major, major uh, regeneration of the, the Morseside um, area in Hamburg. So, um, and I'm not saying that these, this tells a story of classical music actually being really important to loads of people, but it's interesting to think about this uh, potential conflict between how we feel about a uh, and the sort of crisis of classical music and how these buildings continue to be created and where, and potentially for who, which is uh, an important question. The third reason, sorry if this is a bit small, but um, Halls provided important, important insights into how musical values are argued for in wider society. So to follow a, a hall, as I did with this proposed hall for Edinburgh, so this is not a photograph, this is a visualisation. If you follow these halls, you will come across a lot of arguments being made in lots of different areas of society for why the arts and culture are important. The, um, the issue can be that the further away from practice you get, the sort of less sophisticated these arguments become. Uh, and um, so I followed this particular building through its planning application. And there, um, at least in the UK system, it was interesting to come to this forum where there was a real discussion about the building. And actually, it's the only time that publicly elected officials did discuss the building particularly. Um, but at the same time, they could only discuss it through this planning lens. So they could only discuss it in terms of its location, materials, the size of the building, the transport links, and this kind of thing. And it means that uh, the arguments for the artistic um, benefits of this building were began to become tied very closely with other aspects of the physical presence or the materials. So the, the idea of the central location versus uh, a more peripheral location then transformed into a discussion about arts for the elite or arts for everyone in a city. The, the concrete um, got tied to sort of whether it's a sensitive reaction to place uh, or an eyesore. It, concrete also um, became uh, a discussion about whether the building was going to be for the future or um, in terms of its environmental impact or was going to be a kind of uh, white elephant or albatross around, around the city, which also then ties into discussions about classical music's future as well. Uh, sort of, this meant that uh, at these, in these fora there always have to be um, arguments for the building's artistic and social relevance <clears throat> and in terms of the building these also get tied in with the physical aspects of the building so in a, an article um, that I'll, I'll link to this uh, identify three strategies which may be familiar if you've ever read about a building before the urbanistic strategy that its location will mean that people will go there because they're already there and that it's an important location or it's part of a new area that's going to become very vibrant. Living building strategy, this is often discussed around bars and cafes and saying because people inhabit the space um, because of all these interesting things that are happening, then the musical impact will be greater. And finally, the art for all strategy, which is about the buildings becoming a linchpin for educational and community outreach. This final strategy for me at least is potentially the most effective but usually it's the least fleshed out because you don't know how much it's going to cost to rent a room in this building that no one doesn't exist yet. Uh, you don't know who's going to um, use it potentially, you don't know who's going to be able to use it. So it's also sometimes the most open to, to well not abuse but uh, you know uh, there can be some ambiguity there which will actually then mean the building itself is not as effective. And you could say as well that these are very centralised um, investments. So if you really wanted art for all and to reach all these different communities, is a building in the centre of town um, or even just in one location the best way of achieving that? And I think this question of 
and whether outreach is about getting as many people into the concert hall or whether outreach is really going to them is an interesting one and one that uh, spatial analysis really brings up. So uh, just some very quick concluding thoughts. Um, halls show the transformation of musical values as they work through society <clears throat> and this can result in rather unsophisticated arguments being made and also you can get rather distant from musical uh, from where you started so you know as I was reading about concrete and British planning law it didn't feel like the most sort of musical uh, arena but at the same time there are very important musical decisions being made there so I think it's actually important that um, people with strong musical priorities are also heard in these fora. Finally the focus here has been on concert halls but there are also other musical buildings uh, and I for one would be interested in thinking about some of these ideas in terms of conservatoires uh, and music schools as well. Um, this is probably too much information to take in right now and I need to hand over to Denise but I'll put a few links to some of the um, some of the work that's come out of this in the in the chat and quite a, few, a couple of the articles are open access so will be available to anyone. But thank you very much and I shall hand over to Denise once my screen has stopped being blank. There we go. Yes, thank you, Neil. Um, it's always nice to hear about, even if they're your direct colleagues, it's always nice to have these sort of uh, look backs. All right, let's see if I can do this. <clears throat> can you see that all right? Good. Uh, so yeah, um, some of you of course have already seen me uh, during the symposium either as a participant or as a moderator. Um, I'm now in the fourth and very last year of my PhD trajectory and today I just want to give you an impression of um, yeah, what I did during the last four years in this, um, in this research project. Uh, I have to say that I have a background in the conservation of contemporary arts. Uh, particularly performance art and time-based media art, um, the latter of which is a kind of art form that incorporates materials which are temporary or time-based, for example, screens, organic materials, you name it. Um, and basically with this background, I was hired in the third uh, research line of the MCICM, which was on adapting sounding heritage. And one of the main questions that um, yeah, characterized this research line was the question how to take care of sounding heritage. Um, and this question very much falls into my project because um, right now it's entitled, there it is, Resisting Closure, a Museum Studies Approach uh, to Performing the Canonic Heritage of Classical uh, Symphonic Music this way. Uh, and basically what I tried to do in this project is, well, bring together my insights from contemporary art con conservation and museum studies um, with classical music. Um, because muse the museum and classical music are, of course, no strangers to each other. Um, they're both institutions or cultures in which uh, artistic heritage is sort of kept and transmitted through time. Um, and some of you might also know, for example, Lydia Gurr's book on the imaginary museum of musical works, where she describes uh, how the process of the objectification of music, um, yeah, worked as a yeah mechanism for works being collected, canonized, and then becoming very regulative to classical music practice. Um, things that we also discussed, I think, these last two days, um, particularly in the uh, plenary, in the first plenary session. Um, and yeah, of course, while Gurr's um, insights are still relevant and can still help us to explain, you know, how classical music and its works have become so, yeah, solidified um, over time, I felt that um, it doesn't necessarily help us to solve the challenges that classical music faces in light of the future. Um, I mean, we heard Peter talk about the museum problem, right? The idea that classical music is stuck in the past, uh, not able to keep up, not able to become contemporary in that sense. And then the question, of course, is how can we take care of these musical works, um, particularly when we talk about innovation and particularly when we talk about change? So the main question of my project basically was what can classical music learn from the contemporary art museum and particularly contemporary art conservation? Um, now you might think this is a bit of a contradiction because 
I just uh, described the museum, of course, as something as a metaphor that was used to describe, you know, how classical music is sort of fixed and how it is, uh, yeah, basically a past uh, thing. Um, but the thing is, um, the museum has changed quite radically in the last decades. Um, it's a different institution now. It's a different institution from uh, yeah, what Lydia Gurr has famously referred to and from what we now use as a comparison to show how classical music is sort of a past practice. Um, and I think it's a bit unfair because classical music is now, you know, working with the museum metaphor that is a bit outdated. And this is a picture from a work by Doris Sarkedo. Uh, Shibboleth, uh, which was um, um, exhibited at Tate in the Turbahorn in London in 2007. And I really love this picture because it it's such a good metaphor for what happened to the museum in the last, uh, yeah, decades. Because actually, contemporary arts have radically changed the museum as an institution, particularly when we see performative art forms like performance art, dance, time-based media installations, Particularly conservatives have been super busy trying to understand how they can keep these works in the museum and as the institution. Um, and these are works that are changing constantly, that are not fixable, um, that are fleeting, and artworks that are, and that's very interesting because conservatives have also recognized that quite a bit, very much reminiscent of music. And yeah, partly they also use strategies like doing scores in their documentation to sort of try to fix and try to keep these works. But what has happened is that, you know, they have begun to actively rethink and transform very well established ideas of what conservation actually is and what kind of activities it implies. So the developments in the contemporary art and uh, contemporary art conservation have demonstrated basically that the museum problem of today is a radically different one from before. It's a question of how to manage change and not how to fix artworks, of how to appropriately take care of works that by nature are transforming and transformable. And this, of course, is very difficult uh, for the museum because what is a museum then, right? What is the task of these institutions? Um, what is the responsibility of this institution for the future? Um, and I think especially this yeah, ref reflexivity that I've seen in the field and that I've sort of encountered many times, and particularly the change um, in the notion of conservation from you know, fixing and trying to keep a work to the realization that we actually have to take care of how it's changing through time. I believe that this can help us to understand better how to take care of classical music in the future. And this is also where my second kind of main argument comes in. We talk a lot about innovating and we have talked a lot about, you know, change in these last two days and what kind of change we want. Um, but I think that we haven't yet understood well enough how we actually got here, how classical music and its works, you know, have become so solidified and have become so regulative um, in sort of various classical music practices, not only in the concert, but also outside of the concert hall. Um, I mean, we do think about, you know, musicians who learn and who play and who perform, but the way in which we actually very actively conserve these musical works and their sort of connecting traditions and practices, they are much more diverse and much more complex than just performances in the concert hall. And this is also why in my empirical case studies, so I have three case studies, which are basically structured around artifacts or uh, objects, if you might say so. Um, and I basically look at how these artifacts and the practices that connect to them, um, yeah, help to actively sort of conserve and keep classical music, music's works and traditions. And I don't have time to go into all of them now, but these are the three. So I, um, the first case study was on program booklets. So I did a research on program booklets um, at the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra and the London Symphony Orchestra. Um, but also I looked at streaming services, how classical music uh, framed online. Um, there are two streaming services that are analyzed there. One is called Edagio and one is a discontinued service, which has actually been bought by Apple. 
which already shows the sort of yeah developments that take place at the moment uh, which was called primphonic and then the last one is an instrument um, and in my case it's a cello because i'm also an amateur cellist so that was the um that was the logical choice where i looked at you know how is this instrument uh yeah sort of also opened up in sort of physical relations and basically what i did is i paired these case studies with theoretical work from contemporary art conservation and this really helped me to understand how situated these processes of transmission actually are um because I still believe that if we know how these works are kept and what we actually keep and what's connected to this sort of yeah process of keeping we can understand much better where it's possible to innovate and what we actually want to innovate. Um, yeah, maybe some preliminary main findings very preliminary i'm now in the process of wrapping up my project, which is very exciting. Uh, so for some uh, more refined thoughts you'll have to read the final book um, but. The first one is that I think if we think about classical music as an art form that's actively conserved in all kinds of settings by all kinds of actors, I think that this can really help us to understand, yeah, well, the situatedness in which classical music is sort of handed down and how it's connected to also different traditions and different ideas of, you know, uh, values that might be important to the keeping of the music. Um, for example, I saw very intimate connections uh, between safeguarding musical works and canons, but also connecting these works and canons with the maintenance of organizational identities, for example, the orchestras that I looked at, but also the remediation of older media um, when it comes to how classical music exists online, and also the importance of transcorporeal processes of learning and making and playing an instrument which are both sort of physical, but also cognitive and emotional. So I would say that, you know, the transmission of musical works is driven not only by the desire or the need to safeguard the work as an aesthetic object or as a universal or transcendent artwork, but it's also the manifold local and concrete practice, practices, institutional identities and networks that these works existence over time helps to establish and develop that we want to sort of keep because yeah we think we deem them important so the keeping of the musical work is the keeping of a whole lot of other elements that are you know also part of this artistic heritage but also i think what i saw was that classical music and these works and traditions are also constantly done made through the practices to which they are connected they exist in the present very much they draw on past resources but they also kind of elicit or stimulate the use of other traditions and these are often carefully you know negotiated and used to establish again new traditions and identities and this is also i think where contemporary art conservation is particularly helpful how can we you know, allow a work to continue its life within our lives? Where can variability happen? Where can change happen? Where do we maybe need to change our practices, our systems, our institutions to allow for this to actually happen? And I think maybe the last question I, I want to ask you, and maybe that's a, um, a sort of transition to a discussion. Um, I think that asking this question also means that we need to think about what innovation of classical music means outside the concert hall, what it means outside the moment of performance. And yes, that's my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Denise, uh, and also Neil, for your uh, presentations. Um, yeah, and, and this is a moment to open the floor um, and ask if there are any questions. Uh, about the presentations and our work. Uh, let me see. I don't see any raised hands. Um, there is a raised hand by Gerard. 
Geralt, yeah. I, I know how shocking it is for moderator asking for questions and nobody raises a hand. So far, <laughs> one remark about the second presentation and, and uh, the new concert halls or the spaces. And I think there is not a real survey or statistic survey on how a new concert hall brings up new audiences. Because we have a lot of new concert hall, Luxembourg and, and Ed Philharmonie and so on and so on. But we don't have any scientific uh, research on this. And what I, I learned today uh, was from the Elb Philharmonie quite topic that uh, the, Elb, the building of the Elb Philharmonie after five years now has really increased the attendance to classical music, not only the Elb Philharmonie, but as well in the Hamburg Musikhalle, the Leishalle. So that um, I think uh, three, uh, 300 more at least of classical music attendance in all the Hamburg music halls. And you know, this is just by counting, but not scientifically at least. And this would be very interesting how it, really to see if you build a new concert hall in a city, how, however it looks like, you will have this impact on maybe classical music audience, maybe on social welfare, whatever. So there, there is a lack of scientific research what is really the impact? We know about the financial impacts, you know, which which a concert hall has, and how many uh, tax money you invest into uh, arts and culture, and how many comes back, you know, in a sense. This is from the late 80s or 90s, yeah. But I don't see any research on the real impact of building classical music venues, or at least cultural venues, on the on the social and and and. Um, uh, impact for the city or for a region. I think this is really a lack. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, and not just so like audience numbers is one thing. <clears throat> and I imagine the Leishalle has been uh, increased partly because the Alpha Armini is so often sold out. <laughs> Perhaps that might be the case, but um, but it does seem like there is a sort of genuine uptake in, in uh, classical music in Hamburg. Whether that's mainly people from the city is, and you know, and, and exactly who those people, audience are, that's that's another question. But I think for me, the um, that it is likely that there is a bump in um, in audience numbers for a new hall. I suppose for me, it's often the the other claims that are made for these buildings are of interest. So for the the Hamburg Hall and but certainly the Edinburgh Hall that I looked at, very much saying it's going to have a big impact on music education locally and within the region, uh, and it was going to have a big impact on community. And whether that's and again, well, the same thing, you know, that that's even harder to evidence, um, and there's there's no evaluation. So. I would say it very much relates um, to uh, something that Eleonora Belfiore might have said, where she, where she here, which is about um, cultural policy and cultural advocacy. Um, so there are these moments, for example, the planning application, where the it sounds like somebody is sort of trying to um, logically and objectively lay out the impact of a, a building, but actually this is a kind of hoop. A stage that this building has to go through, and they are arguing for the, they're arguing for the building, they're advocating for the building, and whether it's sort of an objective look at the particular impacts of the building is, is another question. But I, I agree, knowing more about this, it would be great, and it's sort of astonishing that we don't, considering how you know, it's consider. I, I don't know how many people here have probably done an arts project that cost six hundred euros, and then they had to fill in an evaluation form. Where is that for the <laughs> for the you know seventy eight billion <laughs> million uh, euros concert halls? It's a, it's a real it's a really yeah it's a, a, a question. I would say. Yeah, thank you, uh, Neil, for your answer, and also thank you, uh, Gerald, for showing the picture in your background, uh, which makes me almost uh, nostalgic because it was taken during our first uh, symposium, which was in Maastricht, and the three subsequent symposia were either cancelled or online. So we're really looking forward to uh, having you again back in Maastricht. Anyway, um, I saw a comment in the chat from Axel. Maybe you want to, to continue on that or? I just wanted to add on what Gerald Mertens said and um, just say that I think it's not just the building, but what is what is happening inside the building and what the offers are in the building. And 
um, the examples of Luxembourg and uh, Paris and Hamburg especially um, shows that there are a lot of Musikvermittlung or music mediation um, offers and this attracts of course new audiences so it's important for those buildings to um, to make those offers possible to to give space for those offers and um, Hamburg for example does this there are those Kaispeicher I think those, those rooms especially um, designed for uh, workshops and music mediation activities yeah I totally agree with that and it's kind of it's often yeah and I'm, I'm often in two minds um, uh, because I think that the buildings ha always have these potential for these impacts but like you say it's more about the um, the collaborations that they that they seem to make possible or, or encourage but it, yeah I, I often wonder do we need the building to, <laughs> to make these collaborations possible and it's always yeah that, that's the question yeah. Well, one, one must agree, I agree on this, but, you know, the Luxembourg Philharmonic, the Elb Philharmonie and other modern concert house buildings have, have been done the last 15 or 20 years, developed the last 15, 20 years, parallel to the uh, development of audience development and music mediation. But what to do with the old halls? You know, and I, I know the discussion from the Berlin Phil when uh, I think 10 years earlier, there was a discussion, shall we have an own building next to the Berlin Philharmonie, next to the Chamber Music Hall and the Great Hall, only for music education. And it, it didn't come reality, but this was the question, where are the spaces, where are the rooms to do music outreach education, etc. not only in the big hall, because you know, there are rehearsals and, and all these spaces are, are laid out for a normal concert. Uh, business, uh, f which we know uh, since uh, the last uh, 100 years. But the, the point is that we need more spaces to do music education with groups, with folk music, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you look up to the north of England, uh, the Sage Gateshead was created as such a community building where you have these spaces for folk music and all the other, other stuffs. Yeah? I think this is very important to think about uh, building new spaces for music education in a, in a broad sense. Thank you, uh, Gerald. Uh, and Anna, you have raised your hand. Um, yes, thank you for the presentations. Uh, I have a question actually from the, to Denise. Um, if you could tell a bit more about the case studies and maybe especially about the, about the booklets and what did you find there? Yeah, thank you, Anna. That's a very nice question, of course, <laughs> for me. Um, yeah, so the program booklets, I, um, uh, what I did was I had a look at, initially had a look at how program booklets would sort of, yeah, uh, try or how you could read them in terms of how they make an effort to keep musical works and traditions. Um, one of the results that I got from that is that actually these program booklets and the way in which they are yeah made crafted you could say um it, so it really exceeds the initial program note right which is about the musical work and it's about how you would sort of listen and this sort of uh, listening experience and explanations information about the work um but actually these program booklets do much more they they really you could say conserve institutional identities and you could really see that, well, for example, with the um, program booklets by the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, um, which were very traditional, of course, in a sense, and also very um, stable over time in their design and their sort of contents and the information that they would disclose, not only about the works, but um, also intimately connected to yeah, the kind of research that the orchestra did with all the resources that it has at hand, which are quite many, of course. So yes, both orchestras um, are, yeah, of course, orchestras which have a lot of resources um, at hand for this sort of production. Um, and many orchestras, of course, also don't have that. Um, and then the question arises, you know, what happens to those orchestras who don't have program booklets that can sort of establish and carry on their identity? 
Um, and with the LSO, it was basically just the opposite of what you could see at Vienna, which was very interesting, where the program booklets helped the orchestra to sort of constantly rediscover their own identity and constantly sort of reframe themselves. Also in the light of societal challenges like, uh, you know, audience diversity um, and um, bringing more people into the orchestra, doing more communal work. Uh, to all, all of this, uh, the program booklets were an essential device, so to say. Um, so yeah, you could see in the end that it was not only about, you know, describing and explaining the musical works. That was part of the note, of course. But it was much more about how this was connected to the sort of framing of the institutional identities and what they would do with that. Yeah. Thank you, Denise. Any other questions? Raised hands. This is the moment. If they are not there, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, to close the symposium. Um, and I would like to do so, uh, first of all, by thanking all of you, the participants, to uh, to be with here uh, with us here uh, on screen. As I already said, we hope to organize our uh, symposium next year in Maastricht again. Uh, thanks for all your questions, comments. I want to thank the presenters in all the sessions uh, because you gave us a lot of uh, food for thought. Um, very interesting. I think it's important to know that we will um, put the recordings of all the sessions on our website, so the whole symposium will be available for anyone who is interested. Um, I also want to thank the organizers, um, the members of the um, organizing committee, so Neil, uh, Denise, Mette Lauchs from the uh, Conservatory Maastricht, Great that you have been here for these two days, uh, Meta. Um, also, Stefan Rosu, who couldn't make it uh, for this session, director of the South Netherlands Philharmonic. Rut Benschop, who has been uh, a member of the um, committee and uh, one of the important uh, people behind the scenes, I would say, in the MCICM. Looking forward to continuing uh, our collaboration. Um, and of course, also, uh, I, I want to thank um, uh, Carolee, uh, Carolee Molina, who is the um, force, uh, silent force, I might say, behind the screens literally behind the screens again this year. Um, so you have made this all possible. And um, without you, this, this symposium would not have, uh, have happened. Um, thanks again, big thanks for that, for all your work. And uh, let's hope that we can uh, continue our working together. And that brings me to uh, maybe a final note because four years of MCICM are now ending and that also means that some of the funding that made all of this possible is going to end that sadly means that yeah some of the researchers the wonderful team that we had over the past four years they will have to um, look for other jobs in some cases you already found them i think of fearle these um but we are also working with the three partners, South Netherlands Philharmonic, uh, South University, the Conservatory, and also Maastricht University, Faculty of Arts and Social Science, on continuing the, uh, the center. And uh, all three partners have now uh, stated that they want to reinvest in the center for another four years which is, I would say, great, because it means that this has not just been a four-year project with hopefully interesting outcomes, but that we can work on continuing, uh, well, let's say the legacy of the institution, but also the many networks yeah, that we have been building over the past four years. Um, many researchers, practitioners, musicians uh, that we have worked with over the past years and hopefully uh, uh, new uh, partners will, uh, will join our networks. So on that actually quite positive note, I uh, 
I would like to end this, uh, this symposium. Again, thanking you all. And after this, and that's also now in the chat by, by uh, Carolee. So following this session, we will have a kind of more informal space uh, if you want, uh, just stay. And we can even create uh, breakout rooms for those of you who would like to talk uh, in a smaller community. Um, so thanks again, and I hope to see you next year, uh, probably in, uh, in Maastricht.